So hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. I want to um, welcome everyone and thank you all for being here. We are um, really honored today to have Anna Kinney presenting for us. Um, Anna Kinney is a patent agent at Dunlap Bennett and Ludwig and she's been working on patent applications since 2005 where she served as the patent ex as a patent examiner um, at the USPTO. Um, as um, a patent agent, she worked on thousands of patents and has firsthand knowledge of the um, of the process, which will be really helpful with today's um, today's uh, presentation. Before we get started, though, I wanted to introduce our small business and inventor hub um, and let everyone know about our hub. So Dunlap Bennett and Ludwig launched a small business and inventor hub. You can find it at dbllawyers.com forward slash hub. Um, this hub is meant to serve the unique needs of inventors, entrepreneurs, and small businesses. We have free resources, transparent pricing, a lot of really good information and ways that you can um, sign, uh, sign up for a consultation with one of our attorneys. So I encourage you to check that out um, to gain additional um, information. So as I mentioned, we're thrilled and honored to have Anna Kinney as our presenter today. Um, I did just introduce Anna, but Anna, is there anything else that you want to to say about yourself, or did I did I cover the the main topics? I think you covered the main topics pretty well. Thank you. Okay. And hello, well, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> great. So well, welcome again. Um, okay. So. Anna, I thought we would start by you sort of talking a little bit about the two types of patents that someone could file, because I think that will sort of frame the rest of our conversation. Right. So the two main types of patents you can file are a utility patent, or you can you can file an application to receive a utility patent and a design patent. A utility patent would be for a product, process, machine, or composition. Uh, you would be protecting the structure or function or both of the of the invention. For a design, that protects the ornamental appearance of the invention. And in some cases, you can have uh, both a utility and a design patent for your product. So for example, appliers with a specific appearance can have both a design and a utility patent. Uh, thank you, Anna. If you if you're just joining us, if you could turn off your cameras and your microphones, just because we are recording for privacy purposes. Thank you. Okay, Anna. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Um, could you just tell us is there uh, is one better than the other? Do you need both? Um, I'm thinking, you know, as we've talked in private conversations, you know, I'm thinking Shark Tank. So which one's better? Is there a better one to have, or do you really need both? A design patent is much easier and cheaper to get, but it's very narrow protection. It only protects the appearance of the invention and it's very specific. So it's usually better if you can get a utility patent to get that, uh, if you have to choose from one or the other. Okay. It is broader, <laughs> it lasts longer, but it's harder to get and it uh, costs more. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's get into some of the meat of the com of our conversation. So what are the key stages in the patent application process from start to finish? The first step would be preparation of the application and filing of it. And then once it's at the patent office, it goes through a, a period of what they call prosecution. So it's examined, it may be rejected, uh, we may uh, the, the applicant may amend uh, claims, uh, respond to the rejections. Once the examiner is convinced that it's allowable uh, and an issue fee has been paid, the patent grants. After that, if you're talking about a utility application, there are three maintenance fees at three and a half years, seven and a half years, and 11 and a half years. Anna, is you, you use the word rejection, which I think a lot of people are sort of, you know, that's a scary word for a lot of people. Is that normal um, for uh, an application to be rejected? It's very normal for the utility applications. They reject, the patent office rejects at least about 90% of the applications they receive. 
design applications do get reject, but rejected, but more infrequently. So about 85% of those get granted without okay. having rejections. I'll ask some more detailed questions about that later, but I just wanted to ask that first. Thank you. All right. How does the process differ between provisional and non-provisional patent applications? Sure. So both of those are utility applications, but a provisional application is temporary. It holds the filing date. It gets your foot in the door. It could be less formal than a non-provisional application. Uh, and it won't be examined, so uh, you don't need to worry about it being rejected. It lasts for one year. If you want to try to get a patent, you'll need to file a non-provisional application before it expires, if you want to use that, that earlier filing date. A non-provisional application is a more formal process. Uh, everything has to match certain requirements that the patent office sets. The uh, application will be examined, and if it is allowed, then it will grant us a patent. Okay, thanks. All right, what are what are the most common challenges faced when someone tries to fat, file a patent independently, and how can having an experienced patent agent or patent attorney be helpful to that person? Excuse me. Uh, Pro se applications, uh, three quarters of the applications they file tend to be abandoned. So most pro se, pro se means they're doing it for themselves. Most pro se inventors are essentially wasting their filing fees. So it costs more to have uh, a professional assist you on this, but it, you're much more likely to be able to get through the process. Uh, you are uh, less likely as a pro se applicant to recognize some of the options you have for moving forward. A lot of people think once you are rejected, that's it, you're done. Uh, clearly that's not the case, um, but knowing what the next step will be, what the requirements are going to be, it's hard to do as an individual. Can you help us to understand that a little bit, Anna? So, so you said something like 90% of them get rejected, of utility patents get rejected the first pass. So what's the process there? I know this is a little off of our of our list of questions, but I'm actually genuinely curious. So what's the process there? Is it just that they're missing something or is that just in general what the USPTO does? And then can you help our listeners sort of understand, you know, how a patent professional sort of helps guide the next steps. Right. So there are, like I said, requirements the patent office has. Uh, sometimes uh, a form is missing or a fee is missing. That would be considered an error that can be resolved. Uh, there might be, uh, for example, the drawings might not be uh, well reproducible and they need to be fixed. Uh, most rejections for utility applications are on the claims, and the most common rejections are either novelty or obviousness. So if you have a an invention that is described fully in one reference, uh, even if it's not otherwise the same, it's considered not new, not novel, and they will reject it for that. Uh, and by the way, they're not the patent office is not looking at the entire application to determine whether it's patentable. They are looking at the claims, which are numbered run on sentences, the sentences at the end of the application. So uh, the examiner will reject the application. The applicant will revise the claims and try to convince the examiner that either they're wrong or there's some additional reason why. It should be allowed. So obviousness is the other is that probably the primary type of rejection. Uh, and in that case, an examiner typically will pull more than one reference. They will pull a primary reference that is similar to what the invention is, and then they'll pull in secondary references uh, to substitute in features from these other references. And they'll say it would have been obvious at the time of the invention to modify the primary reference to come up with the invention. So it hindsight is impermissible, but all 
obviousness rejections involve a little bit of hindsight. Okay. All right. Helpful. All right. How long does the patent application process typically take from filing to approval? We're going to be positive here and say it's going to get approved. So then how about how long does that typically take? Typically, it's about two to four years. Uh, it's taken quite a while for uh, the, the patent office to examine an application. So for a design, I believe their average is 16 months. And for a utility, I believe the average right now is 20 months. The fastest I've ever seen is a couple of months. The slowest I've ever seen has been about 10 years. There can be a wide range. Oh, my gosh. And so is most of it the back and forth between the rejections or is that the time it, it, or the dates that you just gave from when you first hear? Because I can imagine I'm not an inventor, but I can imagine that if I was and I filed for an application, that's a long time to wait. It is. Yes. Uh, it depends uh, if it's. If you can get the the examiner convinced within a relatively short number of responses, then the primary part of that delay is going to be that first 16, 20, 24 months waiting for the examiner to pick up the application. Okay. Thanks. Um, what are the critical deadlines to be aware of during the patent application process? I mean, it's a couple of years, so I mean, there must be things that are happening during those years, right? Yes, when you um, uh, when I was thinking about this question, I also wanted to add a couple of deadlines that are essentially before filing. So uh, if you've made something public or offered it for sale, you have to have an application on file within one year or your own disclosure can be used to reject your application. So let, can we break that down a second? So let's pretend like I came up with some idea. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, some invention. And I want to market it right away. You're saying I need to have an application on file before I can go out and market and sell that object, whatever that is. You can market it before you file the application but you do need to get that application on file within a year. Okay, great. All right, so let's go back. So what steps should be taken before filing an application? Or no, critical deadlines, I'm sorry. Critical right, deadlines. critical deadlines. Yeah. Uh, the other one, as I said, a provisional application only lasts for a year. So you want to get that application, the non-provisional application on file. And by the way, design applications do not have provisionals. Those are only for utility. So once the application has been filed and the patent office issues an office action, which typically will have a rejection or it might have a notice of allowance, there, the um, office action sets a deadline. That is typically an initial deadline of two to three months. Normally, you can have up to six months to respond to that office action, but there are uh, extension of time fees after that initial deadline. In some cases, they're, they are not extendable. So for example, if you get a notice of allowance and you have to pay the issue fee, you have three months, it's not extendable. And how so, do people know when those are due as, a, as an inventor? How do you know? Do you get some sort of notice from your lawyer or from the USPTO or how does that work? The office action on the second page will state what the deadline is in terms of number of months. Uh, if you're working with a practitioner, they will make it clear to you what the initial deadline is and what the final okay. deadline is. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. What steps should be taken before filing a patent application? Um, so sometimes people will think they have an invention if they have an idea of a solution for a problem. They've identified a problem, they have a general idea what the solution might be. It really needs to be more solidified before they can file an application. So sometimes that can be done by preparing a prototype or doing some experiments. 
it's not required to do either of those. It's not required to have a prototype or have performed experience, uh, experiments. But you do have to have um, a conceptual, what they call reduction to practice of the invention. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it might be worth doing a patent search to see to, to, to confirm that uh, this hasn't already been uh, published anywhere. Perhaps even 100 years ago, something similar might have been published. Uh, or to more refine what you are trying to protect. So perhaps you still have an inventive concept, but you just need to shift it a little bit to get to the details that are going to make it new and not obvious. How does someone conduct a patent search? Are there sort of best you know, methods to do that? Other than Google? You can, <laughs> yes, Google has an, a very nice uh, Google Patents website that can be useful for doing patent searches. You can do patent searches on the Patent Office website. Uh, they have a database. Uh, it, there are other ways to do patent searches. Typically, though, as an individual, it's hard to set up the search in such a way that you are going to be, you're going to get a thorough uh, result. So a lot of people are accustomed to doing word searches. Patent searches often will have uh, a categorization built into them. So there, there are classifications of different kinds of inventions, and you can narrow down your search to a particular classification, particular type of invention, and then uh, use word searching to uh, further narrow that down so you're not looking through thousands of results that just I just thought of another question on that on that topic so if if you have an invention or a different way of using something that already has a patent can you get a patent on it for that new you know sort of area so like if something was used for x y you know this sort of category but you came up with a whole nother way to use it in a different category is that patentable or no not immediately uh so you can use something you can transfer something from one kind of technology to another but you have to typically have some kind of reason why it wouldn't be obvious to do so so maybe you're getting a result that is superior than you would have expected and that it's surprising okay. from doing this transfer. Okay. What criteria must an invention meet to be eligible for a patent? You know, I'm a huge Shark Tank fan. So like, that's always the question that one of the sharks asks, like, do you have a patent? Um, so what, what happens? What, what makes something eligible for a patent? So it has to be new. It has to be useful. It has to be not obvious. There are also certain kinds of subject matter that can't be patented. So uh, it has to be statutory subject matter. It can't be uh, natural substances, can't be uh, you know cells in the human body, for example. Uh, it can't be natural laws like gravity. It can't be a set of instructions like the rules for a game. Um, all those things are not patentable. And then uh, it also, your invention has to be enabled. So for example, there is there was a published application, did not get patented, that had to do with an antenna for transmitting to another dimension. Now you can't show how that would work. It would be not enabled. <laughs> Got it. All right. Great example. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, what are the benefits do you think in going through the process of working with a patent attorney or a patent agent during the application process? Can you help our listeners understand that a bit better? Uh, the steps that you would go through? What are the benefits of benefits, working? Benefits, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So your application is more likely to be allowed. Uh, your patent is more likely to have value. Uh, an individual doing their own application is more likely to have a very narrow protection, uh, you know, define their claims down to the point where they're just uh, protecting just a very narrow option. Uh, 
you're going to have less errors, so you're probably going to have fewer responses to the patent office, and you're less likely to, lo to lose your filing date. So for example, uh, perhaps you have published your invention and you file the application, but you're missing a critical component that will set that filing date. You might get that resolved after the first year time frame has expired and then you would lose that filing date you'd lose the ability to patent okay thank you um anna we're going to go a little off questions because we have a question in the chat so i'm going to ask it now um, and we do have a question from one of our listeners who asked if a provisional patent is valid for one year and it takes two to four years to receive a full approval can the provisional be extended? Is that automatically granted? The provisional application does not uh, fit into that two to four year time frame. That would be prior to the two year two to four year time frame. If you miss the twelve month, the one year deadline to get your non provisional on file before the provisional expires, the U.S. Patent Office will they have kind of a loophole. Uh, there's a two-month time frame in which you can file your application with a petition and fee to restore priority to the provisional application. I think we need a little bit of clarity about this because I think I see what the question is. So okay. the provisional patent is valid for one year, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But that is valid for one year that you have to then have already applied. Is that correct? Because I think this question is if it's only valid for one year and it takes two to four years so what happens in that interim i think what you're saying correct me if i'm wrong is that that you have to have applied in that one year not that it stops being valid anymore yes if you file a non-provisional application before the provisional application expires you have patent pending status that will continue okay. until either the application is granted or you stop responding to office actions and the application is abandoned. Okay, so I think that, yeah, thank, you're welcome. That's, <laughs> I thought that was what your question was. So it, it was that gap in between. So it's basically patent pending if you get all your paperwork in time. Yes. Perfect, okay, thank you. All right, moving back to our other questions and please, if anyone else has any questions in the interim, I'll try to pepper them throughout our, our webinar. Um, so what are the key components of a well-drafted patent application, Anna? Well, it might be surprising, but drawings are a necessary component for an application. Anything other than uh, typically a certain kinds of compositions and the methods related to them. So any component uh, that you want to protect has to be shown in a drawing. It doesn't have to be every variation but you have to have at least one version of each component that you want to protect. Uh, all of those variations can be described in the text of the application. Um, it helps to uh, provide examples if there are any examples of, for example, a process, what kind of ingredients you used or what kind of components you used, what kind of results did you get? Uh, there can be definitions to terms. So for example, um, I have a client who does things with blockchain and he used some terms that he thought were very clear, but the examiner did not interpret them that way. So now he wishes he had used other language, other terms in the application. So uh, having, if there's going to be any option of, of interpreting something differently, it helps to have definitions in the application. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and thank you for the, um, the example. I think it's helpful for me, especially to, to sort of understand it on a more example level. So thank you about that. Um, so what are some of the common mistakes to avoid when drafting a patent application? Uh, let's see, I believe I have listed some, yes, okay. Uh, 
So I would say the most common mistake would be not putting sufficient detail into your application. Uh, you are likely going to have to change the claims and you can only include in the in the changes to the claims things that have been filed they are in the application when it was filed so if you don't have that detail in the application you can't add it later so Anna, can you give us an example of that sort of like the kind of detail or in the description in the claims that would make it you know more useful to the examiner and mm -hmm. and in, in terms of getting it actually approved can you help us understand how detailed that should be uh uh, the example I'm thinking of is not a good one. <laughs> so um, it varies how detailed it needs to be. Okay. Uh, but for example, if um, what I'm thinking of is uh, an example where it was a, a tiller and uh, there were weights on certain spots of the tiller so that it would come down with a more forceful impact at certain points. And the applicant only generally described that in the application. There were no drawings. There wasn't any more detail on it. And so we couldn't use that in the claims to support getting the application allowed. Okay. The example that I'm thinking of, I don't know why, is because um, I know that it was a, a client years and years ago was for these insoles that was supposed to make high heels for women, like never, their feet never hurt. So it's you mm -hmm. know, sort of like a gel pad that goes in a high heel. So I'm assuming for that particular example, they would have had in the patent application to have t said sort of everything that this little small gel pad would do in terms of taking the pressure off of a female's foot in terms of being in a high heel, for example? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe not. It depends on, on what, what was getting that result. So perhaps uh, they had a particular kind of gel and it had to be positioned in a particular place in the insole. Um, that may be all they need to describe. Um, they might have variations that they want to describe, uh, but perhaps they don't have to say other than where the gel is and where, you know what kind of gel it is. They may not have to describe the insole in general. So sort of a secondary question to that, how can inventors ensure that their patent claims are strong and defensible? If they if they don't describe it, does that make them susceptible to someone else saying, oh, well, I have this, that's a better version of that, and so they can't defend it? Is that is that sort of what happens on the practical side of things? And how can inventors ensure that their claims are defensible and strong? Um, I think those are kind of two different things. Um, so in order to prove that somebody has infringed on your patent, all you have to prove is that they have uh, infringed on every feature in at least one of the independent standalone claims. So if you have three criteria in your claim and your opponent has uh a product that meets all three of those criteria, it doesn't matter what else it does or what else it has, it infringes. Okay. Um, in terms of making it strong and defensible, um, one of the examples I'm thinking of is there was a case, uh, Chef America versus Lamb Weston in 2004, that the claims were written to require that the dough was heated to a particular temperature range. It was very high. I think it was maybe 400 to something. And they meant that the oven was heated to that temperature range, but that's not what they said in the claims. So precision is really important because mm. once they uh, had that problem, their opponent managed to get out of, not only get out of the patent infringement, but also invalidate the patent. Wow. Okay. Great example. Thank you. 
Um, back to talking a little bit about drawings. What is the role of patent drawings? How should they be prepared? Could you give our listeners some guidance on that? Like I said, they're essential in most cases. Uh, and you have to have each component shown in the drawings. It's not necessary that they be formally prepared, but it's advisable because uh, patent illustrators who do this for a living typically know how to bring out the features that you're trying to protect. They also know how to avoid uh, doing things to the drawings that will make them not reproducible properly so you won't have those additional um, errors that the patent office rejects. So, um, thank you. Hope that's very helpful. All right. And, so oh, I was going to say, oh, go ahead. Color drawings are not acceptable unless it's absolutely necessary. So you can't just, you know, a lot of people have color drawings showing different features, and uh, the examiner will require that those be submitted as black and white, or they may just be reproduced in black and white. You might lose some detail. Um, just curious, what what. Do you know why? Like, what what is that? I would think color would be to, better, but it, it has to do with publication. The patent office publishes ah. the patents in black and white. Okay. If you're Thank going you. to get something in color or a photograph, you have to state it in the uh, application itself or in the patent itself, and the public needs to know that they can get the color copies for an additional fee. Ah, okay. Thank you. That's very interesting. All right. So. What happens after your years of experience, right? So you did this for, you know, in the USPTO. What happens after the patent application is submitted to the USPTO? Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are thinking like two to four years, like what is going on? Like what what's happening behind the behind the wall? So can you give people an understanding of sort of what happens next? Yeah, so the application is going to initially be examined for formalities and completeness. So if you missed paying a fee, for example, they'll send you a notice requiring that you pay the fee. If you didn't submit a form, they will come back to you asking for the form. Uh, and then once that's done, uh, it will be classified. Like I said, there are different classifications for different kinds of inventions. And each examiner examines a certain technology group so it's classified and then assigned to the technology center where it will be examined. And then it will be docketed to the examiner who will end up doing the examination. It has to be taken up in order when it was received, except for certain situations where you get it uh, expedited. Okay. And does the patent examiner do all of the, that or is there more detail? Like what else it, are is he or she looking for other than obviously that first you said the first initial pass did they have other forms did they make the correct payments then what happens after that are they looking at it from you you talk a lot about the claims at the end is there anything between yeah. the <laughs> the fees and the claims like what else is that and the drawings what else is happening well all of what i just described happens before the examiner even gets it okay. so uh that can be that first couple of years. Once the examiner has it in their docket and they pick up the application, they're going to do a patent search. First, they're going to take a look at the claims and uh, interpret them in their broadest reasonable possible um, way. So for example, if you have zero to five percent of something, the examiner doesn't have to show that ingredient because it could be zero, it could be not app, it could be completely absent. So they're going to narrow down what they have to look for and they do a patent search. Then they will write up a an office action comparing the invention as it was claimed to the results that they got. And they will also bring up uh, other things such as, for example, like I said, there are certain things that cannot be patented. And so if there's something like that, they will bring that up as well. Okay, so let's stay on office actions for a second. What are they and how should applicants respond to them? An office action is essentially an opinion from the patent office. So uh, a government 
opinion of the patentability of that invention. Uh, it has to be responded to if you want to keep the process going. It will also have an, an explanation, so you, it's worthwhile to go through that explanation, you or your uh, practitioner, whoever is working on it, um, and look for perhaps some errors. Uh, you may also, like I said, have to change the claim language to get around the interpretation that the examiner used. And uh, is it somewhat subjective, Anna? It is. It's subjective. Okay. It's a bit of an art form. Okay. Thank you. So, I, that's what I'm yeah. sort of taking from this conversation. Okay. It, it can also be helpful to have a, a phone call with the examiner, which is called an interview. Um, you schedule time to talk to the examiner. It allows you to do the back and forth a little quicker. Uh -huh. uh, and a little determine, bit of a dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, determine whether maybe you and the examiner are reading something differently. Or uh, um, maybe the examiner has a suggestion that just is not going to fit into the format of writing up the response. You know, a general idea of where to go with something. Great. Very helpful. All right. So how can inventors expedite the patent examination process? Is there a way to do that? There is. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a little different between a, a design and a utility application. So for a design application at any time, you can file a rocket docket, a petition or request for a rocket docket, which uh, once it is granted, they try to get the, uh, the examination done within two months. You have to have had a patent search for that. So you may have to do a search and submit uh, forms related to that search in addition to the fee. Uh, but like I said, you can do that at any time. With a utility application, there are a couple of options. You can file a track one request when the application is filed and it has a fee. Uh, you can't file that afterwards. So if you want to expedite it after it's filed or even when it's filed and you don't have to pay the fee, you can uh, make it special for age or the, the inventor's health. Uh, if the inventor is over 65, they can qualify for making the application special. Um, there are certain programs that the patent office is trying to to uh, prioritize as well. So enhancing the environment, energy conservation, counterterrorism, things like that, you can get okay. made the application made special. And they try to get the entire process done within a year. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. All right. So what happens and what are the options if a patent application is rejected, like a real rejection? All rejections are real rejections, I guess. You know, there are objections and rejections. But Okay, help uh, us to understand the difference. Okay, so an objection is a formality. Um, okay. So perhaps you have the structure of your claim in the wrong way. The okay. examiner will object to it. Um, most rejections can be overcome. It might require changing the claims, um, identifying a feature that is missing the, in the references the examiner has picked up, uh, persuading the examiner that the rejection is wrong. So, for example, if the examiner is modifying the way a filter works and it would no longer work the way it was in, originally intended, then that that modification can't be done. Um, and then if you can't convince the examiner, you may want to appeal to the, they call it the PTAP, so let's say the board, um, and get a, a, it's a group of judges, so get their opinion about whether or not this should actually be allowed. Anna, is there is there any number, a uh, maximum number of times that you can go back on the rejections? Like, go back and forth? You pretty much get two what we'll call bites at the apple for the initial fee. So you get a first office action and a final office action. Okay. You can do a little bit more after the final office action, but for the most part, uh, in order to move forward again, 
you have to file a request for continued examination with another fee, and then it restarts the clock. So if the examiner is going to reject it again, you'll get another first final uh, first office action, and okay. then possibly another final office action. Okay. Or you might get a notice of allowance. Okay, perfect. That that's very helpful. So. Once you get your patent, we'll think positively here. So we got through the rejections. We've answered all the questions. We have a patent now. How long does it last and what are the requirements for maintaining it? Design applications are simple. It is 15 years from when the patent grants and that's it. Utility applications can last for 20 years from the earliest filing date. And like I said, there are three maintenance fees during that time. So if you fail to pay a maintenance fee, that um, patent expires. So it could be up to 20 years, but it could be shorter depending on whether you've paid those fees. Okay, very helpful. Anna, do you have any last thoughts for everyone on the, on the call in terms of the process um, and what's important? Um, I think that uh, I think a lot of people are concerned about sharing their invention before they've figured it out totally. And you may need to consult with somebody else to work out the details, um, whether that's your practitioner or perhaps a manufacturer. So sometimes people will get non-disclosure agreements so they feel more comfortable talking to somebody about it. So it's not public. Got it. That's helpful. Good. Um, let me ask the listeners um, if they have any questions, you can put them into the chat. And while I'm waiting to see if there is anyone, Ayla, could you put up the hub um, visual one last time? I just want to remind everyone that's on the call that if you do have additional questions or you're looking for support um, in Pushing forward um, your invention, uh, Dunlop, Bennett and Ledwig does have this small business and inventor hub. Um, you can find it at dblawyers.com forward slash hub. Um, there's lots of good free resources there. Um, also, you could set up a consult um, so that you could talk to someone about your invention. Um, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Thank you, Ayla. She's actually put the link right in the chat. So if there are no other questions, I just want to first off, thank Anna for sharing your expertise um, with pleasure. everyone. Super interesting. Um, and thank everyone for joining. Um, our team will send out the link uh, with the video so that you can rewatch this if you missed the beginning um, so that you have it for reference. Um, and again, if you have any questions, you can uh, find information at dblawyers.com forward slash hub. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Anna. Really great and super informational. And um, thank, thank you. you. Have a, everyone have a great day.